Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animal Rights Overview by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker. In our book, Zoopolis, we proposed a new and distinctively political approach to the rights of animals in an effort to bypass some of the increasingly stale debates that have dominated the field. To oversimplify, much of the debate to date has revolved around the question of the intrinsic moral status of animals. Many animal rights theorists have claimed that because animals possess sentience or consciousness, and therefore have a subjective good, they have the sort of moral standing that justifies certain inviolable rights to life and liberty, and in particular, the right not to be used as a means to human well-being. In response, critics have argued that to be a possessor of such inviolable rights requires something more than sentience or a subjective good. It requires some alleged higher capacity, typically a cognitive capacity, such as rationality or autonomy or moral reasoning, and therefore only humans can be the bearers of such rights, and, moreover, by virtue of possessing these higher capacities, humans have the right to use other beings who lack these capacities. Animal rights theorists, hereafter AR theorists, in turn have responded that restricting inviolable rights to those with a certain degree of cognitive complexity is both theoretically arbitrary and at odds with our actual practices. Indeed, the evolution of the theory and practice of human rights in the last 60 years has been to repudiate any limitation based on the rationality or autonomy of the beings involved. Inviolable rights are first and foremost for the protection of the weak and vulnerable, not some sort of prize awarded to the most rational or cognitively complex. You are undoubtedly familiar with the broad outlines of this great debate on animal rights. In our view, the claim of AR theorists is indeed correct. Any being with a subjective good, any being who experiences life from the inside, qualifies for certain inviolable rights. However, we have little new in our book to say on that topic, and have no wish to rehash that 40-year-old debate. Rather, our aim is to emphasize how little that debate actually tells us about the rights of animals, or more generally, about what justice requires in relations between humans and animals. This focus on intrinsic moral standing is just one part, and perhaps even a small part, of what an overall theory of animal rights must address. We can see this by comparison with the human case. To be sure, one step in developing a theory of rights that human beings possess, or a theory of justice amongst humans, is to ask what we owe each other simply in virtue of our intrinsic moral standing. And this might give us something like a theory of universal human rights, as reflected in the UDHR. However, most political theory is not about the question of what all human beings owe all other human beings in virtue of their intrinsic moral standing, but rather about the specific rights and responsibilities we have towards particular others in virtue of a range of morally significant relationships, including relationships of cooperation, of collective self-government, and of histories of interaction and injustice. To illustrate this, imagine that we come across a crowd of human beings getting off a plane at an airport somewhere in our country. Without knowing anything about our more specific relationships with particular individuals in the crowd, we already know that we have certain universal obligations to all of them, simply because they are sentient beings with a subjective good. These are the universal rights we owe to all persons as such. For example, we cannot torture them. But as the crowd proceeds to passport control, it quickly becomes apparent that these individuals have quite different legal and political rights. Some of them are our co-citizens, and as such, they have the unqualified right to enter and reside in the country, and once inside, they have the right to be considered full and equal members of the political community. That is to say, they are co-guardians of the country, with the right that their interests and concerns count equally 
with others in determining the direction of the country. As citizens, they are members of the people in whose name the government acts. They have the right to share in the exercise of popular sovereignty, and society has a duty to create mechanisms of representation or consultation by which their interests will be counted equally in determining the public good or the national interest. By contrast, other passengers on the plane are tourists, foreign students, refugee claimants, business visitors, or temporary workers, who are not citizens. As such, they do not have an unqualified right to enter the country. They may need to have secured permission beforehand, e.g. through a visa. And even if they have permission to enter, they may not have the right to settle permanently or to work in the country. Perhaps their visa only allows them to stay for a short period of time before having to leave. As such, they are not included in the people in whose name the government acts. They do not participate in the exercise of popular sovereignty, and there is no duty to create mechanisms of representation to ensure that their interests are counted in determining the public good. Of course, to repeat, these non-citizens are still human beings, and as such have certain universal inviolable human rights. It would be impermissible to kill or enslave them, or to engage in other acts that deny their essential personhood and dignity. But there is no obligation to restructure our public spaces to make them more enjoyable or accommodating of such non-citizens, or to restructure our political institutions to make them more accessible to such non-citizens. It may be that the hundreds of thousands of Chinese tourists who now vacation around the world would enjoy visiting New York or Paris more if there were more Chinese language street signs. And if a city wishes to attract tourists, they may well choose to make such changes. But there is no obligation on citizens to make their cities more welcoming to visitors. And it is the citizens, not the visitors, who make this collective decision about the shape of their society and its public space. The visitors do not get to vote in elections or referenda determining policies about street signs. In short, we typically distinguish between universal human rights, which are not dependent on one's relationship to a particular political community, and citizenship rights, which are dependent on membership in a particular political community. As they embark from the plane, all passengers possess the former, but only some possess the latter. To oversimplify, we could say that the interests of citizens determine the public good of the political community, whereas the interests of non-citizens set side constraints on how political communities pursue that public good. For example, in deciding whether to build more public housing, nursing homes, or subways, it is the interests of the citizens, not tourists, that are determinative. But of course, we cannot enslave tourists to help us build those houses or subways. The universal human rights of non-citizens set constraints on how citizens of a political community pursue their public good. Now this is an oversimplification, because as we will see, there are various in-between categories of people who are more than mere visitors, but not, or not yet, citizens, and whose interests need to be considered in a way that is more complicated than this simple dichotomy allows. For example, immigrants who gain long-term residency acquire a certain legal and political standing that differs from that of temporary visitors, even if they do not yet have citizenship. There may also be groups who are affiliated to the state through some form of historic political association other than standard citizenship. For example, the status of American Indian tribes as domestic dependent nations, or the status of Puerto Rico as a self-governing commonwealth. In recognition of the fact that they form a distinct sovereign people within the boundaries of a larger sovereign people. But the existence of such in-between groups, with partial or overlapping citizenship statuses, simply confirms the underlying point, namely, that the fact of being a person 
with universal human rights underdetermines one's legal rights and political status. In Zoopolis, we argue that the same general principle applies in the case of animals. Here, too, the intrinsic moral standing of animals underdetermines the rights that animals are owed, which will vary with the types of relationships they have with human communities. Indeed, we think the same general categories often apply in the animal case as in the human case. That is to say, some animals are best seen as co-citizens of our political community, some are best seen as citizens of their own separate sovereign communities, and some fall into a range of intermediate categories, each of which generates distinctive claims of justice. In the rest of the paper, we will give a schematic overview of the theory developed more theory in our book, starting with the case of domesticated animals.